Even if you've been exploring machine learning, there's a good chance you haven't come across Gaussian processes yet. If you have, you might have found it difficult to grasp the mathematical intuition behind them. Welcome to DigiLab, I'm Anna, and in this series, we're going to dive into the wonderful world of Gaussian processes. In this first part of the series, my aim is to share the basics of Gaussian processes in a way that is approachable and easy to digest. By the end of this video, you'll have a proper understanding of what Gaussian processes are, how they work behind the scenes, and their main applications. Make sure that you check out the full reading tutorial that accompanies this video in the DigiLab website. You'll find the link in the description below. Plus, you can download other useful resources. Now let's break down what to expect in this video. In this video, we introduce Gaussian processes, a powerful mathematical framework used in machine learning for both regression and classification problems. Two perspectives on Gaussian processes are explained, the correlation modeling approach and the distributions over functions approach. We'll look into how data collection informs predictions and quantifies uncertainty and discuss the importance of understanding core principles like Bayes' theorem, which underpins many predictive models. We explain how Gaussian processes are non-parametric and provide flexibility in capturing complex relationships and uncertainty in predictions without predefined parameters. This approach contrasts with traditional curve fitting, offering greater adaptability and flexibility, although these come with their challenges as well. Finally, we will discuss situations where using Gaussian processes makes sense. We will also explore some examples and real-world use cases. So without further ado, let's start learning. Hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any data science and AI adventures. Let's get started. There is something truly fascinating about Gaussian processing's versatility and all the applications where they are the perfect solution. But what are they? A Gaussian process is a mathematical tool that helps us understand and model relationships in data. But instead of predicting a single value, like saying the temperature tomorrow is 25 degrees, a Gaussian process gives us a range of possible values, acknowledging that we're not entirely sure. It's like saying, I think the temperature is around 25 degrees, but it could be higher or lower. There are two ways of looking at Gaussian processes, as a way of modeling correlation between points and as distributions over functions. To understand this approach, let's imagine you have booked a holiday to America in autumn and you want to know what the temperature is there then. I know the temperature in Boston in autumn, but even if you ask, I won't tell you the exact value. Without providing any additional information, you might think, well, I could check Google for the average fall temperature and its variability. But based on your general knowledge, you might assume a Gaussian distribution center around 24 degrees. In other words, you're making an educated guess that temperatures are most likely to be around 24 degrees, with fewer occurrences of temperature deviating significantly from the average. Now let's shift to Seattle, on the other side of the country. You could estimate a slightly colder temperature, say 20 degrees, with a similar distribution. You arrive in America, and your first stop is Seattle. Now you actually know the temperature in Seattle, because you are there and plan to fly to Boston. Does that information from Seattle help you predict the temperature in Boston? Probably not, as they are too far apart geographically. However, if we imagine a line between Seattle and Boston, the closer you get to Boston, the more informative the temperature readings become. For example, if you are 10 miles outside Boston and know the temperature is 24 degrees, you can be reasonably confident it won't be 18 degrees in Boston. This concept aligns with Gaussian processes, which don't model the function itself, but focus on the correlation between points. They use a kernel function to describe this correlation structure. In simple terms, and using this as an example, is about understanding how knowing the temperature in one location influences our confidence in predicting the temperature at another location. Factors like distance, historical data, help us model this correlation effectively. Another way of understanding a Gaussian process is as a distribution over functions, where each function can be thought as an infinite dimensional vector. But what does this actually mean? Imagine you have a set of limited data points representing the temperature at a city at different times of the day over the past month. Now you want to make predictions for the temperature at different times where you don't have data points. We don't know what happens between some of these points. In other words, there is some uncertainty about what happens there. So first, 
you can consider a lot of possible cards that could go through those dots. Really weakly ones, really smooth ones, not the weakly ones. Then, when we want to make a prediction, we want to ask ourselves, What's the most likely function that goes through that? While well, being aware that we don't have all the information. After that, we start to collect more data. This restricts the possible functions that could go through it, and as a consequence, we reduce the uncertainty. That's what a Gaussian process does. We believe that before we collect any additional data, the possible functions between points have a certain look. And that's my prior. And then we collect data and start restricting the functions that agree with our data. Now, each of these possible functions is like an infinite list of numbers. However, since inputs can be any real number, the vector is infinite. So when we say that a Gaussian process defines a distribution over functions as infinite dimensional vectors, it means we're not picking one specific function but considering all possible functions, and for each function there is an infinite set of values associated with different inputs. This concept allows Gaussian processes to capture uncertainty in predictions. Instead of giving a single prediction, they provide a distribution of possible outcomes, which is valuable in scenarios where there might be multiple plausible explanations for the observed data, or where uncertainty in predictions is crucial. Let's talk now about Bayes' theorem and how this is a fundamental concept when it comes to understanding Gaussian processes. Bayes' theorem provides a way to update our beliefs or probabilities about an event based on new evidence or data. The formula of Bayes' theorem is expressed as this. This term represents the probability of event A occurring given the event B has occurred. This is called the posterior probability. This term is the probability of event B occurring given that event A has occurred. This is called the likelihood. This term is the prior probability of event A representing our initial belief in the probability of A before considering new evidence. And this last one is the probability of event B occurring. In simple terms, Bayes' theorem allows us to update our prior beliefs about the probability of an event A given new evidence B. It provides a structured way to incorporate new information and adjust our beliefs based on observed data. From a more practical perspective, Bayes' theorem basically says, hey, you are the expert, tell me what could happen based on your knowledge. This initial expert opinion is what we call the prior. Then we collect real data, and if the data matches our initial opinion, great, things are easy. But if there's a difference, it's okay. We just end up with some uncertainty. Now here's the thing. If you're familiar with neural networks, if you don't, don't worry. It's kind of like they're hardcore data fans. They say, give me all your data. I don't care about your opinion. I'm just going to predict. But Bayes' thinking is different. It's like you have the power to say, I know the output value should be between, say, 0 and 1. That makes sense. And then when you see new data, you update your predictions based on evidence. This updated opinion is what we call the posterior. So you define your initial thoughts before you even have the data, that's the prior, and then you adjust those thoughts based on what you actually observe. The key idea behind Gaussian processes is that they allow us to model functions and their uncertainty without explicitly specifying a parametric form for the function. Instead of defining a fixed set of parameters, a Gaussian process is characterized by a mean function and a kernel function. Here, f represents a function drawn from the Gaussian process. m is the mean function, which provides the expected value of the function and a given input. And then, k is the kernel determining how the function values at different inputs are correlated. The mean function represents the average behavior of the function, while the kernel captures how the function values vary with respect to each other across different inputs. The choice of the kernel depends on the specific requirements of your Gaussian process, and different kernels can be chosen based on the characteristics of the underlying data. One commonly used kernel is the radial basis function, or Gaussian kernel. Sigma is the variance parameter, which determines means the overall scale of the function, and L is the length scale, controlling the width or smoothness of the kernel. In our next video series, we will explore the different kernels that exist and when to use them. However, I want to show you one of them, so it's easier to explain what Gaussian processes are non-parametric models. To understand this, let's first explain what a parametric form is. 
A parametric form refers to a specific formula with a fixed set of parameters. These parameters determine the shape, behavior, and characteristics of a function. For example, the parametric form of a straight line in a 2D space is given by this equation, where m and b are parameters that define the slope and the y-intercept of the line. Non-parametric models, on the other hand, do not have a fixed functional form with a predetermined number of parameters. Gaussian processes fall into the category of non-parametric models. However, it does use parameters to describe the kernel. Now, why is this different from fitting a curve? When you fit a curve, you might bias it by choosing a certain form, like a straight line. This is a traditional way, but it lacks flexibility. There are only two parameters and it's not great for modeling possible correlations. In the case of Gaussian processes, you are not defining parameters in the fitting model. Instead, you are modeling possible correlations without specifying parameters for them. So, although some people might think it's parametric because of parameters in the kernel, it's not exactly the same. In the context of regression, a Gaussian process might model the relationship between inputs, for example time, and outputs, temperature, without specifying an exact equation. It considers all possible functions that could explain the data and provides a distribution over these functions, capturing uncertainty in the predictions. So basically, a parametric form has a fixed equation with its specific parameters, while a non-parametric form, like a Gaussian process allows for greater flexibility by not specifying a predetermined equation and capturing uncertainty by considering a distribution over possible functions. Let's do a little recap. A Gaussian process defines a distribution over functions by saying that the values of the function at different points are jointly Gaussian distributed. The mean function represents the average behavior, and the kernel function captures how the values at different points vary together. This mathematical formulation allows the Gaussian process to model a wide range of functions while capturing uncertainty in predictions. The specific form of the mean and kernel functions determine the characteristics of the functions in the distribution. When we say Gaussian processes allow us to model functions without explicitly specifying a parametric form, we are not confined to using a predetermined equation with fixed parameters to represent the function. Instead, Gaussian processes provide a more flexible approach. Rather than committing to a specific functional form, they define a distribution over all possible functions that could describe the data. This flexibility is particularly useful in situations where the true underlying function is complex or unknown, and we want the model to learn the functional relationships directly from the data. Gaussian processes can adapt to the complexity of the data without being limited by a predefined set of parameters, making them valuable for capturing uncertainty in predictions and handling a wide range of functional shapes. Gaussian processes are particularly valuable in scenarios where data is limited and uncertainty is high due to their ability to provide probabilistic predictions and adapt to the available data. Here are some examples and use cases. So the first example is predicting the performance of a new chemical compound based on limited experimental data. So in situations where collecting data is expensive or time consuming, Gaussian processes can model the underlying relationship between inputs and outputs, even with a small number of data points. The uncertainty estimates allow practitioners to understand the reliability of the predictions. The next example is optimizing the parameters of a complex simulation model, such as an engineering design or climate modeling. Gaussian processes can act as a surrogate model for computationally expensive simulations. With a few valuations of the expensive function, the Gaussian process can provide predictions and uncertainty estimates, guiding the optimization process efficiently. The next example is tuning hyperparameters of machine learning models with a limited budget of evaluations. In this case, Gaussian processes are central to Bayesian optimization, where they model the unknown objective function. The Gaussian process guides optimization by suggesting new points to evaluate based on the expected improvement and uncertainty estimates, making it effective in scenarios where the function evaluations are 
resource intensive. Another example is detecting anomalies in sensor data from industrial equipment. In cases where normal behavior is well understood, but anomalies are rare, Gaussian processes can model the normal behavior and identify deviations. The uncertainty estimates help flag potential anomalies and indicate areas where the model is less confident. And last example is trajectory planning for a robot with limited sensor information. Gaussian processes can be used to model the uncertainty in the robot's perception and environment mapping. This is crucial in a scenarios where the robot needs to make decisions with incomplete or noisy information, such as navigating through unknown environments. In all these cases, the ability of Gaussian processes to provide not just predictions, but also uncertainty estimates is key. This uncertainty information is vital in decision-making processes, allow us to make informed choices, even in situations where the data is sparse or noisy. In engineering, where experiments can be expensive or time-consuming, Gaussian processes offer a powerful tool to make informed decisions, optimize the science, and handle uncertainty effectively. And this is all for this first video of the series. But what is next? You can continue exploring Gaussian processes on the Streamlit app in the resources section by playing around with the different parameters. In the next video of this series, the kernel cookbook, we will explore how different kernels define the similarity between data points. We will discuss their definitions, interpretations, and the impact of hyperparameters. We will talk about kernel manipulation and combination techniques, such as adding and multiplying kernels to capture different aspects of the data. I will also give you some tips to choose the right kernel based on data characteristics. Don't forget to like and subscribe to be updated with our latest tutorials and upcoming content. Make sure you download the video resources in the DigiLab website when you can also find more courses on data science and AI. You can also find the reader and tutorial linked in the description. Thank you so much for joining me in this journey. I can't wait to see you on the next part. Bye!